This meeting is now being recorded. Well, again, good evening. Welcome to our EDS Awareness Educational Series webinar. My name is John Furman. Before we introduce our speaker, we'd like to give an overview of our free program for those attending for the first time. So we'll go over who we are, what is our program, some upcoming events, introduce our speaker this evening, Kevin McDowney, and then we'll have a Q&A session. So again, my name is John Furman. I manage the National EDS Awareness Program based in Cincinnati, Ohio. My daughter, Deanna, who's also on the call, leads the Cleveland, Ohio EDS Support Group. She was diagnosed with EDS in 2008, the same year my wife passed away with breast cancer. I was a caregiver for my wife who struggled with undiagnosed EDS for over 30 years. We introduced our program at the 2012 EDNF conference to help EDSers form independent local support groups and spread EDS awareness in their communities. We've started over 90 groups to date. Each group is given their own free website with a link from the directory and map. We receive feedback that conferences provide valuable information and social opportunities, but many cannot afford physically or financially to attend in person. So we decided to bring the speakers to you through the free EDS Awareness Educational Series. We meet every first and third Tuesday, typically at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. All the programs are free, the meeting announcements, and whenever possible, the webinar recordings will be posted on our website at edsawareness.com for later replay. You can receive email announcements for free future sessions by requesting the free report on our site. Tonight's presentation is sponsored by Body Support Store, where you'll find over 250 products selected by EDSers for EDSers. The store is the only funding for this program, and it usually covers our monthly web fees. Please visit our store and check out the helpful products that we sell. Just a general disclaimer. This presentation contains general information about PBS. Members of the EBS community voluntarily participate in this program. The information is not advice. If you're having medical problems now, please call 911. Always consult your doctor before making any changes to your treatment. A couple of our upcoming webinars include November 17th, Dr. Clive Bridgham presents Inflammation, Metabolization, and Nutrition. And on December 1st, Dr. Neil Schechter will talk about pediatric chronic pain for EDS. Here are a few more of our upcoming speakers. You can see um, all the way in th through February 2016 by going to our webinars page on the website, and that will always show you the full upcoming schedule. For those attending live, there will be an opportunity for Q&A after the presentation. Add your question at any time by clicking the Q&A icon at the top of your screen. After typing in your question, click the orange button to submit. Our speaker tonight is Kevin Muldowney, and his topic will be physical therapy for Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome related to his new book. Kevin's the owner of Muldowney Physical Therapy, and he published his new book in July of 2015. It outlines a specific exercise protocol designed for people who are diagnosed with EDS. Kevin has been treating the EDS population since 2005, and his protocol was designed to slowly and safely progress patients through an exercise program 
to ultimately strengthen their entire body while stabilizing numerous, numerous joint subluxations or dislocations that are commonly associated with the disorder. Learn more about the book on our website at edsawareness.com, and there will be a special link there where you can purchase his book. So uh, without any further ado, I wanted to uh, extend a warm welcome to Kevin, and we're going to go ahead and load your uh, slides on the screen, and I will turn the microphone over to you. Thank you very much. Um, before I get Thank started... You. Uh, before I get started, I would first like to thank both John and Deanna for allowing me to come to speak with everybody today. Um, these webinars are a great way for medical professionals working with the EDS population to disseminate information to you guys about what we have found is helpful to you in order for you to live a better life with EDS. They've also been a tremendous help to me in order to get the word out to all of you about my new book. Because of their hard work, we are helping people all over the world with EDS using my book. Before I get started, I'd like to introduce myself and my book to you. My name is Kevin Muldowney, and I am the owner of Muldowney Physical Therapy in Cranston, Rhode Island. My entire practice is devoted to helping people with EDS live a better life through exercise, manual therapy, and patient education. I have been treating people with EDS for 10 years now. I have developed an exercise protocol designed specifically for this population, taking into account the many unique issues facing a physical therapist while treating a person with EDS. My clinic has helped so many people with EDS using my protocol that I decided to write a book entitled Living Life to the Fullest with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I wrote the book so that other people with EDS could achieve the same benefits from my exercise program that my patients do every day. This book outlines my exercise protocol, which I developed to help safely stabilize the many subluxations associated with this genetic disorder. What separates my protocol from others is that I take into consideration the protection of every joint in the body while using specific exercises to stabilize each region of the body. This is why people with EDS will not hurt themselves while exercising using the Muldowney Exercise Protocol. I understand that beginning a new exercise program may be scary for some, and therefore I have also developed a Facebook page entitled Living Life to the Fullest with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which allows people to post questions to me regarding my exercise protocol. This way I can help answer questions from both people with EDS who are going through my protocol as well as their physical therapists who are treating them. I am fully committed to helping this population and this book is the first step to educating the PT community on how to effectively treat EDS, thus allowing this population to get their lives back from EDS. This book was written for people with EDS to buy and bring to their PT so they can go through the exercise protocol together. The best way to use this book is to read the first two chapters mocked for the person with EDS and then give the book to your physical therapist and they will read chapters one and two entitled For the Physical Therapist. In the sections mocked for the, physical ther person, for the person with EDS, I explain what is going on with your body in layman's terminology so that you can understand why exercise is so important in your life. In the section For the Physical Therapist, I outline the subluxations that occur in each joint and what manual therapy techniques I have found most helpful for your physical therapist to use on you in order to decrease your pain while progressing through my exercise protocol. I also list possible problems that may occur while going through my exercise protocol and how to fix each problem. I basically wrote in my book every trick I have developed over the past 10 years to help your PT get you through my protocol. I believe that anyone who cannot find a PT 
or who understands EDS or has a PT they are working with but is not getting good results should buy my book and give my protocol a try. I am dedicated to helping this population achieve a better life. And I believe that with the use of this book and a skilled PT, you can achieve significant improvements in your life. The rest of my discussion today will focus on how to exercise a person with EDS. My objectives today are as followed. I will talk about what to do once you are diagnosed with EDS, the physiology and biomechanics of a joint subluxation, the rules for exercising someone with EDS, the best combination of manual therapy versus exercise, and common subluxations in the EDS population. EDS is a heterogeneous group of heritable connective tissue disorders characterized by articular hypermobility, skin extensibility, and tissue fragility. Only a geneticist can diagnose you with EDS. Once you are diagnosed by a geneticist with EDS and they explain to you what type of EDS you have, what do you do next? If you are like my patients, you scour the internet for information about EDS. After a couple of days on the internet, you begin to look like this guy. There are some great websites to get you started. EDNF.org is a great place to begin to get a global understanding of this genetic disorder and gives you a great foundation of knowledge. EllisDanlosNetwork.org gives you the research part of EDS and is a great place to also go. Finally, all of you know about this website. John and Deanna have done a great job having these webinars to help medical professionals disseminate information to you guys about their area of expertise. Since EDS affects many structures in your body, not one doctor can be an expert in all areas involved with EDS. This is frustrating to most people with EDS, but this is why you need to develop a good medical team to help you with the many issues you, you may have. Since EDS affects many structures in the body, you need to develop a team of healthcare professionals to address the many problems associated with EDS. I listed here some, but not all of the healthcare professionals that need to be on your team. The most important member of your team is your primary care physician because it is their job to gather information about you and decide which member of the team they need to refer you to in order to address a specific issue. Not all information from the other members of your team need to go through your primary care physician so they can gather this information and help you through this process. I equate the PZP as the head coach on a football team. All of the other doctors will give your PCP a progress report about you and how you are doing in their area of expertise. Your PCP will gather the information from all the other doctors and then will prioritize what issues need to be addressed at the time you see them. I believe the most important thing a PCP can do for you is to prioritize the many issues you are having and have them treated accordingly. I am not going to go over all the members of our team, but I just want to mention a few. The cardiologist will treat things like POTS. A neurosurgeon will look at things like tethered cord, carry malformation, and cranial instability. A gastroenterologist will look at leaky gut as well as gastroparesis. 
A nutritionist will work on diet and food allergies for you. A pain doctor will work on managing your pain as well as your inflammation. And an orthotist will work on bracing for you. A physical therapist is also on your team and can be a vital link between you and your primary care physician because they will be seeing you two to three times per week for six to 12 months as you go through my protocol. They will be able to observe changes in you and convey the information to your primary care physician in a monthly note to them. Communication among healthcare professionals is key when treating people with EDS. I will now be discussing what a physical therapist can help with as a member of the healthcare team. So what a physical therapist's role on the healthcare team for EDS is their primary job is to decrease the occurrence of subluxations of joints in the body both through exercise and manual therapy. First, let's define the difference between a joint subluxation and a dislocation. A joint is defined as a place where two bones meet and there is movement between these two bones. A dislocation is defined as a complete separation of two bones where they meet at a joint. Take your left hand and make a claw with it with your fingers bent slightly. Next, make a fist with your right hand. Then place your fist inside your claw hand. This will represent a joint, with your hands representing the two articulating bones. Notice the two bones are touching. If you slide your right hand forward between your thumb and second finger so the hands do not touch anymore, this represents a dislocation. When a dislocation occurs in a joint, it hurts a lot, and more importantly, it looks weird. You usually have to distract the joint to relocate it. Fortunately, this does not occur often in the EDS patient. What does occur more often than not are subluxations which are defined as partial separation of two bones where they meet at a joint. So make your left hand claw again and your right hand fist again. Then place your right fist into your left claw hand again to represent the joint. Now slide your hand again between your thumb and second finger until your middle finger is out but your but your pinky finger and ring finger are still touching. This represents a subluxation. Subluxations can hurt a lot as well, but usually people with EDS learn to reduce these subluxations by themselves without the help of someone else. These are the party tricks people with EDS show, like to show their friends and post on Facebook. Hopefully after this webinar, no one will perform these potty tricks ever again. So in review, a dislocation is a complete separation of two bones in a joint. It looks weird and you usually need someone else to relocate the bone. Whereas a subluxation is only a partial separation of two bones in a joint and because there is still articulation between both bones, you can learn to relocate these bones yourself. It may look a little weird at first, but you can quickly pop it back into the socket and it will look normal again. People with EDS usually sublux, not dislocate. So what helps prevent a joint from subluxing? The two structures that help prevent a joint from subluxing are muscles and ligaments. Both surround a joint, but each have different roles in stabilizing a joint. Ligaments attach from one bone to another and are considered primary stabilizers of a bone. Ligaments do not produce movement 
and only stabilize the joint. Therefore, ligaments are considered inert tissue. Muscles attach from one bone to another and are considered secondary stabilizers of a joint. Unlike ligaments, muscles have contractile proteins which enable them to move bone. Therefore, muscles are considered to be an active tissue. The difference between ligaments and muscles is that the ligaments have no contractile protein and therefore cannot be strengthened by exercise, whereas muscles have contractile proteins and can be strengthened by exercise. Therefore, strengthening decreases pain by stabilizing the joint using the secondary stabilizers, which are the muscles. This is why exercise is so important for people with EDS. I will explain more in depth on the next slide. So how does a joint sublux? To answer this question, you need to understand how both ligaments and muscles support a joint. Both ligaments and muscles have the same two roles when it comes to supporting a joint. The two roles are to provide proprioception to the joint and to absorb external forces. Proprioception is your body's ability to know where it is in space. Proprioception does not allow you to overextend your joints and sublux it. It also helps prevent you from falling by telling your body where it is in relation to your body's base of support, which are your feet. People with EDS have poor proprioception and therefore frequently overextend and increase, which increases their joint's ability to sublux. They also fall a lot, which we can all agree is bad for this population. Exercise can help this. A physical therapist can work on proprioception and balance with you once you have enough strength to stabilize yourself in space. What exercise can also help with is the ability of a joint to absorb external forces. External forces can be lifting your child, jumping, carrying groceries, or reaching back for your seatbelt. Ligaments are made up of collagen, which is deficient in the EDS population and causes the ligaments to be weaker. If a ligament is weak, it will not be able to absorb as large of an external force before it fails, causing the joint to sublux. Since ligaments are weak in the EDS population, a person will rely on their secondary stabilizers, the muscles, to protect the joint from external forces. The stronger the muscles are around the joint, the larger amount of external forces it can absorb before subluxing. This is why exercise is so important to both joints that hurt to help stabilize them as well as joints that do not hurt yet to help protect them. Here is an example of what I mean. Let's say a ligament around a joint can absorb 10 pounds of force before it fails, and the muscles around the same joint can absorb 10 pounds of force before it fails. The total amount of external forces that joint can absorb before it fails is 20 pounds, 10 pounds from the ligament and 10 pounds from the muscle. Again, these are fictitious numbers. If the external forces are under 20 pounds, the joint is protected and it will not sublux. But if the external forces exceed 20 pounds, the joint will sublux and be in pain. How we can help the joint absorb more forces is by exercise. If the muscles get stronger, then it can increase the overall strength of the joint it surrounds, allowing the joints to absorb larger external forces before it fails. For example, 
the same joint that could only absorb 20 pounds of external forces now goes through an exercise program to strengthen the muscles around the joint and can then absorb 30 pounds of external forces after the exercise protocol. The same joint now can absorb twice as much force after strengthening as it did before strengthening. After strengthening, it can absorb 10 pounds from the ligaments because exercise has no effect on the ligaments and can absorb 30 pounds from the muscles that you strengthen with the exercise protocol for a total of 40 pounds of force that the joint can now absorb before it subluxes. Because the joint is twice as strong, you will be able to enjoy more activities before you get hurt. Therefore, exercise is the most important thing a person with EDS can do to help prevent subluxations and achieve a higher quality of life. Now understand, my protocol, we are building more endurance than power. So higher quality of life does not mean running a marathon or skydiving, but rather going to school with less pain, watching a movie, walking to a picnic with a friend and not feeling horrible the next day, exercises will just decrease your overall day-to-day -day pain. People always ask me, so what about just stretching and getting massages? Will that just help my tightness or strengthen me? To me, this is the most important slide in my lecture. Most people with EDS do not see themselves as weak, but instead consider themselves to be very tight. Most want to be stretched or massaged to loosen up their muscles. This should not be done because the muscles in a person with EDS are not tight, but rather they are in spasm as a direct result of their hypermobility. A spasm is defined as a sudden involuntary contraction of a muscle or group of muscles. So because your joints move too much, Due to their hypermobility, the muscles around the joint will automatically contract in order to help support the joint. The reason for this is when a joint is hypermobile, there will be inflammation and pain causing the receptors in the surrounding muscles to become hyperactive. Therefore, the muscles around that joint will go into spasm in order to help stabilize that joint. If you try to take away the spasm with massage or stretching, it will feel great when you are done. But as you walk around, the joint becomes painful again because you have taken away the spasm, which was the supporting structure to that joint. Now that the joint is painful again, the muscles around it will go back into spasm due to the muscle receptors becoming hyperactive again as a protective mechanism for that joint. Therefore, the spasm is not the problem, but a byproduct of the true problem, the hypermobility. When a, jo when a joint's ligaments are very weak and the muscles around the same joint are very weak, the body has two choices. Either let the joint completely dislocate and have horrible pain or spontaneously contract all the muscles around the joint to try to have the secondary stabilizers hold the joint in place. The problem with this is that when a muscle is in spasm, it hurts and it is achy and massage makes it, makes it feel better because it gets rid of the achiness for a while. But eventually, the hypermobility of the joint will allow the spasm to return. So when you go to a massage, to, when you go to get a massage and you feel great coming out, but a few days later or hours later, you feel horrible again, now you'll know why. The proper approach is to strengthen the muscles around the joint, which will decrease the muscle spasm. Once the muscles around the joints are adequately strengthened, the spasms will usually decrease. Therefore, exercise is the most important tool 
that this population has to decrease their muscle spasms. Manual therapy techniques such as myofascial release and muscle energy are beneficial only in conjunction with this exercise protocol. No manual therapy technique should be performed on a hypermobile joint unless the joint is being strengthened with my protocol. Manual therapy techniques do not fix anything with EDS. It only allows you to exercise with less pain, which is still very important because who wants to be in pain when they exercise? This is why it is so important to have a manual physical therapist guide you with this protocol so they can make your journey less painful. And who doesn't want that? So we went through a lot of heavy physiology over the last 10 minutes. So I just want to summarize um, a little bit. So ligaments and muscles are very important because they absorb external forces. The stronger the muscle, the more external forces that joint can absorb before it subluxes, which makes you more functional in life. A muscle is also not tight, it is in spasm. Do not take the spasticity away with massage, but rather strengthen around the joint to give that joint strength to hold the muscle in place, and then the spasticity will go away. Working with a physical therapist who is highly educated in understanding this physiology will make your life much less painful while going through the protocol. Strengthening a person with EDS is very different from strengthening other people. This is why so many people with EDS get hurt when beginning an exercise protocol. For the EDS population, we need to have rules to help physical therapists strengthen this population safely. When you begin the Muldowney exercise protocol, it should be under the guidance of a physical therapist so that they can show you the proper exercise techniques and provide proper manual therapy to, to specific joints to decrease your pain while exercising. A physical therapist's most important role is to, to problem solve any issue that may arise while you're going through this protocol. Remember, the physical therapist is the expert in exercise in the healthcare team. I have eight rules that need to be followed by you and the physical therapist so that you don't, get, you don't hurt yourself while exercising. Rule number one, never ask the PT to work on a body part that is not being strengthened. Manual therapy is designed to align sublux joints and decrease muscle spasm. It is okay to decrease muscle spasm in order to decrease your pain while you are also strengthening the muscles with my exercises. Manual techniques such as soft tissue mobilization, massage, myofascial release, trigger point release help to decrease muscle spasm so it will be less painful to exercise. Manual techniques such as muscle energy, mulligan techniques, and joint mobilizations are designed to align the bones which are sublocks. The last three techniques I just mentioned decrease, also decrease muscle spasm, but they also place the bones in alignment. When a bone is in alignment, the muscles that attach to the bone will be at optimal length. Optimal length is defined as a length at which a muscle can exert its maximal isometric steady state force. Therefore, a muscle which is at optimal length is easier to strengthen. In my clinic for SI joint pain, we would perform muscle energy to the patient to align the bones, perform myofascial release to the quadratus laborum, piriformis, and psoas to decrease muscle spasm. Then we have the patient perform the protocol exercises and progress the protocol when they are ready. This is our routine in a nutshell. 
no significant changes occur until you reach the top level of each exercise progression. So we continue the SI joint routine until they reach level three mat and level three ball exercises, which are the two top levels in the SI joint progression. Once this area feels better, we move on to the, the next exercise progression in chapter three. Next rule, follow exercise order exactly. You need to follow the order of the exercise protocol exactly. The reason is that if some regions of the body is not worked on first, it will adversely affect other parts of the body as you perform your ADLs, making it difficult to get through the progression. I group the body into three sections, the SI joint and low back progression, which I have discussed extensively in my last webinar, the neck, mid-back, and arm progression, and finally the leg progression. This is very hard to, to determine where to begin with a patient who has many subluxations and global pain. I decided to begin at the SI joint because it is the keystone of the body. The sacrum is the bottom part of the spine. The pelvis, or a nominate bone, is the top part of the leg. Therefore, any dysfunctions at the SI joint will affect the spine up to the head as well as the hips, knees, and feet. After I fix the SI joint with my progression, I follow that same I found that some people, the mid-back and neck become more pain painful. This made sense to me because as I changed the orientation of the sacrum and the pelvis, new external forces would be produced up the spine. These new external forces from the new posture I created now may have exceeded the total strength of both the ligaments and muscles in the mid-back and neck causing other issues. This is why we strengthen the neck, mid-back, and arms with the next exercise progression in order to decrease these neck and mid-back problems that may arise from your new posture. Our last exercise progression works on strengthening your lower extremities. Custom orthotics fix a lot of the lower extremity issues, but it does not it does take some time to get custom orthotics measured and ordered. We usually order custom orthotics when a person completes level two of the neck, mid-back, and upper extremity protocol. If a person with EDS cannot tolerate full weight bearing, you can use a tabletop to help decrease weight bearing requirements of the legs. During the exercise progression, Balance exercises are also incorporated as well as working to improve a person's posture. Once we strengthen all three areas of the body, we move to phase two of my protocol, which are the functional activities like stair climbing and tossing a ball. This is the rationale for the order of my exercise progression. Rule number three. Progress exercises to your tolerance. This is important. I have listed a progression for every exercise in my book. These are only guidelines and not cast in stone. Every person who goes through my protocol will progress at a different rate. Some people take more time than others. This is where you need an experienced physical therapist to observe your progressions and to cut the progression timeline back if needed. My progression for most exercises starts at one and a half minutes to build tone, adding 10 seconds a day until reaching three minutes. Once you reach three minutes, you're ready to progress to the next level. This may be too aggressive of a progression for some people. This may have they may have to progress every second or third day as they get to the higher levels in my progression. They also may only be able to do a level three times a week 
to give their body a rest between exercise sessions. Listen to your body because with EDS, it does not pay to push through the exercises. Believe me, I've tried and lost every time because pushing too hard only leads to inflammation in the joint you are strengthening, which leads to decreased muscle activation and increases the chances of subluxations in that joint. So if you are progressing nicely in the protocol and then hit a wall in your exercises or feel you are getting worse, then change your progression to see if that helps. Not all people with EDS will be able to complete the top level of every progression. I just had a 14-year-old girl finish my protocol. She went there and was doing fine with no pain. She was on level five neck but when we progressed her to level six neck, she got worse. We tried to do two to three day progressions, but finally decided she was not strong enough for level six because she was only 14 years old. So we stayed at level five. She had no pain in her neck, so who cares if we didn't get to the top level? Our only goal is that you have decreased pain. Rule number four, identify and eliminate triggers at home to allow for less setbacks. Triggers are defined by me as some activity you do at home, work or play, that subluxes your joint and of which you are unaware that, that this activity is causing these subluxations. Such activities as jumping, running, sleeping or sitting improperly can cause certain joints to sublux without you knowing. This is my EDS trigger statement I hear every day. I don't do anything and my joints just dislocate. Even with EDS, your joints do not just sublux. You have to do something wrong in order for a joint to sublux. Remember what I said before. Because you are weak and your ligaments are weak, your ability to absorb external forces is low. Therefore, the number of triggers at home is high. But as you get stronger, some of these activities or triggers may be added back into the picture. Working with your physical therapist to identify and eliminate these triggers or modify them will help you to progress through the exercise protocol with less pain. Working with your physical therapist on proper body mechanics for activities that hurt you may decrease the external forces enough on the joint to allow you to perform these activities at home without pain. Poor body mechanics increase external forces on a joint while good body mechanics decrease external forces on a joint. Just by performing an activity properly may be enough to allow you to do that activity at home with less pain. This is where a good physical therapist can help you through this. Bracing a joint for a specific activity will also help decrease your pain for day-to-day -day activities. Modifications of activities when you are weak, then slowly add these activities back in will help speed your process through the protocol. Running and jumping will always be bad for people with EDS because the increased forces on the SI joint with these activities. I will discuss this later in my um, speech. Rule number five, dealing with setbacks. Everyone who has EDS will have a setback while going through this protocol. Properly identifying the triggers for the setback and using the setback principle outlined in my book will help speed up the healing process. When you have a setback, there is increased inflammation in the system. So modalities that decrease inflammation 
and behavior modification will speed up the healing process. In the EDS population, it usually takes about two weeks to fix a setback. Address new issues immediately. Addressing new issues immediately is essential for treating this population. With EDS, little problems become major issues quickly. Even if you are not yet at an injured joint in the protocol, you need to address the new issue. The physical therapist should contact their patient's primary care physician to inform them of the new issue. Modalities, bracing, manual therapy, and beginning, beginning level one of the area that was newly injured is appropriate for addressing a new issue. Once the new injury is calmed down, return to the protocol wherever you let off. It, it should only take a couple of weeks to decrease pain in the, in the new injury. Then continue with the protocol after two weeks. If the injury continues to linger, bracing is an option. An example of this was I was treating a young girl with EDS with severe back pain and spondylolisthesis about a month ago. But her neck was pretty good. She then was carried by her brother who smacked her head up against the door. She was only three weeks into my SIJ and lumbar spine progression when she smacked the door with her head. After the incident, she now complained of headaches and dizziness, so I contacted her primary care physician to get her an aspirin collar to calm her neck right down, right away. We began level one neck while I performed manual therapy on her neck to calm everything down. In a couple of weeks after getting the brace, she was much better and we continued the SI joint progression. This is just one example of how setbacks occur on a daily basis with the EDS population. Rule number seven, do not quit. I'm going to tell you a story about my patient, Sue. Sue came to my clinic a couple of years ago after seeing several physical therapists before me, many of them claimed to be EDS experts and manual therapists. She came up to me and said she could not exercise and could not perform manual therapy on her body because it would cause her too much pain. I explained to her my problems and my protocol and she decided to give it a try. We started with the SI joint and in about eight to 10 weeks, her SI joint was much, much better with very little pain. Her worst problem was her mid-back and it took some time. And after eight weeks of working with manual therapy and progressing through my protocol, she sat me down one day and said, Kevin, I don't think this protocol is right for me. I think I need to quit. I told her we needed to figure out the triggers that were the problem with her, it's not the protocol. We sat down and we figured out that she was driving in an hour and 20 minutes, three days a week to come see me and that was hurting her mid back and neck. We decided to get her a mid back brace and we cut her down from three times a week to once a week. And she was progressing her exercise at home accordingly. With this, after we figured it out, she got much better, and after about eight more weeks, she, her mid-back and neck had no pain. I DC'd her at 11 months with no pain throughout her body. I tell you this story because if it wasn't for Sue figuring out the triggers and helping herself, she would still be sitting in a chair today saying that physical therapy can't help me and not knowing where to turn. So it's important for everyone, once they start this protocol, not to quit. My final rule is fight with everything you have to take back your life. Keep hope alive. Never let in 
EDS interfere with your dreams. You only have one life, and you deserve to have a happy life. Yes, EDS is a tough genetic disorder, disorder to have. I am not arguing that. But you need to find people who will help you. It is not in your head. There are reasons why you feel the way you do, and you need to find the right people to address these issues. You need to build your health care team. Your local EDS support group can help you find them. John and Deanna have a list of the support groups all across the country. And going onto their website and finding one near you and asking them who the healthcare members who treat EDS are is a step in the right direction. So remember, no matter how frustrated you get, keep fighting. I have been discussing manual therapy for a while now, but what is manual therapy? Manual therapy is when a physical therapist uses their hands to affect muscle, fascia, tendon, bone, and lymph. Manual therapy techniques which help EDS include, but are not limited to, muscle energy, cranial sacral, myofascial, and visceral therapy. I use all of these techniques in my clinic, but the two I use the most are muscle energy and myofascial techniques. The problem with all of these techniques is that they all decrease muscle tone. All of these will make you feel great, but unless you use them along with exercise, they are likely putting a Band-Aid on a gushing dam. Exercise is the true winner for people with EDS to see real long-term improvements in health. In the beginning, you should only strengthen and should never stretch. Remember, if you decrease a muscle spasticity by stretching, your joint will become hypermobile because the spasticity is the only thing that is holding the joint together. You need to strengthen the muscles in order for the muscle strength to hold the joint together, not the spasticity. How do you strengthen and what muscles are important to strengthen is outlined in my book. The most important thing to remember about exercise for EDS population is to focus on endurance. The best PT procedure for a person with EDS is to go to a physical therapist with my book and have them provide manual therapy to the body parts being strengthened in order to decrease your pain and spasticity while exercising. You then strengthen the area the physical therapist just worked on with the exercises outlined in my book to add strength to the joint in order to stabilize it. Once you have reached the top level for a specific exercise progression, then you may proceed to the next exercise progression listed in my book, which is the next chapter. So my book should be read over the course of a year, not all at once. Learning self-correction techniques is key to helping you perform the exercises with less pain. Teaching your family members to perform self-corrections on you at home can give you decreased pain while you're working on your home exercise program. I usually have family members come into my facility and have them perform muscle energy techniques to the person with EDS to align the bones as I videotape them with their phone. This way they have the video to refer to at home if they forget how to perform the self-correction techniques. Now at home, the family can perform muscle energy techniques to the person with EDS before they do their exercises each day in order to align the patient's bones and put their muscles at optimal length, which will allow the person to strengthen the muscles easier. <laughs> it is up to the physical therapist's discretion as to which body parts they will allow a family member to correct. In my clinic, 
I will show family members how to fix the sacrum and pelvis, sometimes the ribs, and how to tape the shoulder and knees. <laughs> I never let a family member touch the neck or the head. The more your family members can help you at home, the less you have to rely on the physical therapist, <coughs> Excuse me, which is helpful for those EDS patients who do not have a lot of physical therapy visits per year. <coughs> so how do you find a physical therapist in your area that knows how to treat EDS? People tell me all the time that this is hard to find a physical therapist in their area who knows a lot about EDS. This is the main reason why I wrote this book. With my book, you do not need to find a physical therapist who knows anything about EDS, but instead you need to find a good manual therapist who is willing to follow the Muldowney exercise protocol outlined in my book and you should be fine. In my book, I walk the manual physical therapist through my protocol step by step, teaching them what to do in order to achieve the best results for you. In my book, there is a section next to every exercise entitled, For the Physical Therapist. This outlines how to modify each exercise if it is causing you pain both in the area you are working on and in other areas of the body that I have found problematic over my 10 years working with this population. This way, the manual physical therapist can feel comfortable working with you. To further help you and your physical therapist, I have developed a Facebook page, which is, which is the title of my book, Living Life to the Fullest with Ellis Danlow Syndrome. You or your physical therapist can post questions about the book so I can help you get through the protocol. This way you will not feel alone going through this process. Finally, you need to find a physical therapy facility that will allow the physical therapist one-on-one -on -one time with you. The most important thing to effectively treat a person with EDS is one-on-one -on -one time with their physical therapist. We give our patients 45 minutes of one-on-one -on -one time with their physical therapist every session in our clinic. This way we can address the issues which may arise daily with this population. So find a manual physical therapist in a facility that gives you one-on-one -on -one time with them. Then bring the book and begin your journey. If you run into trouble, have your physical therapist send me a message on Facebook and I can problem solve it together. I usually like to talk to the physical therapist rather than the patient if there is a problem. This way, me and your physical therapist can use medical terminology or PT language to figure out the issues. Then we can problem solve them together in order to quickly and accurately decide how to best help you. I wrote this book to help people. I know this book will help a lot of people if this population will give it a chance. With that being said, there are things that inhibit strengthening in the EDS population that are not physical therapy related. Not everyone with EDS will be able to complete my protocol. EDS affects many structures in the body which means there are many problems that are, can occur with the EDS population that inhibit strengthening and are not physical therapy related. <clears throat> this is why you need a team of healthcare professionals to address these issues as they arise. I have listed some, but not all of these problems that can affect strengthening. Tethered cord, Chiari malformation, and cranial instability are issues that affect the nervous system. Therefore, these issues will not allow for proper neurological input to the muscle 
to, the, to allow the muscle to strengthen effectively. Digestive issues, mast cell, mitochondrial issues cause global inflammation in the body. Inflammation inhibits muscle strength and makes it tougher to strengthen. Cardiac and pulmonary issues decrease oxygen to the muscle, and even issues like POTS makes it difficult to exercise because your heart is racing. And let's be honest, who wants to exercise if they are dizzy, nauseous, and their heart rate is 140? Finally, just because you have EDS does not mean you do not have other orthopedic issues like meniscal tears, labral tears, or rotator cuff tears. An orthopedic doctor can rule out these issues for you. So if you have gone to an orthopedic for joint pain and they said nothing is wrong with you in the past, you should now be happy instead of being frustrated because there are no orthopedic issues that will inhibit you from completing my protocol. So if a patient of mine is not progressing through the protocol, then it tells me some other issue is stopping them and they need another member of the healthcare team to help us out and address the issue impeding the progression of the protocol. The physical therapist needs to inform the patient's primary care physician about the issue so that the PCP can refer the patient to a specialist in order to address the issue and allow the patient to progress with the exercises. Remember, as a physical therapist, I only deal with subluxations, not other issues. This is why having a good medical team is so important. So what are some of the subluxations that occur in this population? I will now discuss some common dysfunctions associated with EDS from a physical therapist perspective, which we can help. Sacrum and pelvis dysfunctions are the first thing we address in my book. The SI joint is the dimple of your butt and is on either side between the sacrum and the pelvis. The sacrum is considered the bottom part of the spine while the pelvis, or innominate bone, is considered the top part of the leg. Two-thirds of your body weight pass through the SI joint from your head, arm, and trunks to your legs. Only ligaments support the SI joint. No muscle crosses the SI joint. The SI are the dimples of your buttocks. If you poke these dimples and feel pain, then there is an SI joint issue. I did a webinar two years ago about SI joint dysfunction, dysfunction in the EDS population, which was more in depth. There are three issues of the SI joint in the EDS population that presents differently than in the non-EDS population. I will discuss these three issues now. The first issue is a double upslip. An upslip is defined as a superior subluxation of an innominate bone on the sacrum. So this is the innominate bone right here, and it actually goes up. So this pelvis will look higher than this pelvis. Usually, in the non-EDS population, this occurs with running or jumping, and usually only occurs on one side. In the EDS population, you usually have an upslip on both sides, not just one. So not only did this one go up when I jumped, but this one also went up as well. This actually makes the whole spine squish together. Your physical therapist needs to correct one side of the upslip, then assess the other side for a double upslip. You can only assess for a double upslip once you fix one side. Second, the sacrum 
is usually flexed on one side and extended on the other. So this sacrum right here. And in my last lecture, I made everyone be the sacrum for a second. So if you put your hands out to the side and you turn your body to the left, my right hand will be forward, which we call a flex sacrum, and my left hand will be now backwards, which is called an extended sacrum. So in the EDS population, usually your sacrum is either rotated to the right or to the left, causing one side of your sacrum to go backwards or into extension, and the other side of your sacrum to go forward or inflection. Third term I have coined in my book is called a double rotation, which occurs in the spine. If you look at this line, this is the midline of a joint, and these objects right here are your spinous processes. When I draw a line, the line should go through the spinous processes all the way down. In the EDS population, I have found that once in a while there will be a rotation of a vertebrae to one side and a rotation of the vertebrae just above it to the other side. This is an area of high concentration of pain for this population. The problem with this population, I have found that these double rotations occur throughout the spine and you can have multiples of them. When you're poking on someone's spine as a physical therapist and you find a hot spot that hurts a lot, it is usually an area of a double rotation. Identifying as a physical therapist where these double rotations occur and using manual therapy to decrease these double rotations throughout the spine can decrease your pain considerably throughout the entire spine. Chapter 3 of my book discusses thoracic spine, cervical spine, and arms. I believe that you need to address all of these areas at the same time because they all affect each other. Most of these issues are due to poor posture with increased kyphosis, forward head, and forward shoulders. You can see here, if I drew a line down here, right down a spot, her ears, shoulders, feet should all be aligned. This right here is called an increased kyphosis, and a forward head and her shoulders are forward. This posture is very normal in the EDS population. The first thing that needs to be addressed is a double rotation in the mid-back and the neck, especially at C1, C2, because double rotations at the C1, C2 area can cause dizziness, headaches, and nausea right up in here. Double rotations in the thoracic and cervical spine look exactly what we discussed in the lumbar spine. Next, the physical therapist needs to address rib pain. A rib is located one and a half inches away from the midline of your back. So if I go to the mid part of my back, you'll see these little bumpy things which are called spinous processes. If I go out one and a half inches, you'll see where the rib inserts. My next slide, which I'll go over, will show it a little more in depth. Here is the spinous processes. Here is where the rib inserts into the vertebrae. This is called the transverse processes. And this is called the coastal transverse joint. Okay, and this is where the area of pain will allow. So as you go up, if you go one and a half inches away from the midline of the spine, you find this joint and you poke on it and it hurts, there is a dysfunction there. 
use of proper muscle energy techniques can help with any rib subluxation. Next, the shoulder may sublux inferiorly out of the socket and may also move forward or backwards. So your shoulder is actually inserted right in here. And what happens is, is do, there's a ligament underneath right here called your inferior glenohumeral ligament. And if that gets overstretched, the actual whole entire shoulder will fall down out of the socket. We call that an inferior subluxation of the shoulder. Once that occurs, this shoulder can either move forward or backwards. So some of my EDS patients come up to me and say, my shoulder subluxes forward or backwards. That usually does not occur biomechanically. So what actually happens is it's actually so loose that it falls completely out of the socket and then whichever muscle group decides to pull it that day pulls it either back or forth. But the major thing is to push this shoulder back up into the glenohumeral fossa to get it back up in the fossa, uh, the glenoid fossa. If you can tolerate taping, it will significantly help your pain. But remember, when we're taping, we want to tape the shoulder back up into the joint first to get it into the socket. And then we can either tape it forward or backwards or whichever way you want to go. Now, when the subluxation of the shoulder occurs, it can cause rotations in the spine as well as rib subluxations and especially headaches at C1, C2 with double rotations. So I'm going to go back to my last slide here. If this shoulder comes out, it's going to pull this whole scapula down and there are muscle attachments that attach all the way along here in the spine pulling this down. As I pull this down, it can start causing rotations up here. It can actually pull and have the rib sublux. It can cause rotations here, all because the shoulder is inferiorly subluxed. What I do as a physical therapist when someone comes in with a lot of headaches and stuff, I want to see if the shoulder is a major process to that. So what I do is a quick test where I usually use um, to protect. A uh, quick test I usually use is to have the patient cross their arms across their chest. Then I place my hands on their elbows and push the elbows up gently into the socket. And you can actually feel that go up. If the headaches go away or are considerably reduced, then the shoulder needs to be addressed ASAP. Next, I like to talk about is the elbow. The elbow can sublux either out or in, and that's where their subluxations are due to the medial or lateral or outside or inside collateral ligaments being overstretched. So if you put your palms out to the side with your hands facing forward, the bottom part of your forearm can either move out or in, which can then cause pain in this area or in this area. I use mulligan techniques work very well for this issue. The wrists and hands are hard to stabilize with exercise because there are not a lot of muscular attachments. So you may need to protect these areas using splints if you are at school or work. I am not a big fan of bracing and taping all the time because bracing and taping weakens a muscle. And our whole goal with the My Protocol is to strengthen muscles to absorb forces. I like bracing and taping for activities only. The next one we can go to now is the foot. This is one of my patient's foot right here. 
everybody just can bear with me now. I know we're, we're going pretty good, but there's only a couple more slides left. Legs are discussed in Chapter 4 of my book. The foot controls the knee. That's important. People with EDS have flat feet or their foot is pronated, just like this person right here. This needs to be controlled using a custom orthotic. The reason for this is that besides obvious foot pain that comes with having a flat foot, your ankle and knee can also be injured if your foot pronation is not controlled. When your foot is flat, your ankle bone, called your talus, subluxes forward, so it moves in just like this. Once this occurs, every time you take a step, you will have pain in the front part of your ankle, right up in here. Eventually, the top surface of the talus, called the Taylor Dome, will start to wear away and cause you pain at all times. If you make a claw with your left hand and a fist with the other, and have your fist sublux forward just a little bit, then rotate your fist arm up into the air, eventually the top part of your fist will hit into the claw. Eventually, this piece will actually wear away and will cause you a lot of pain. So when you're walking and you have pain in this area, it's usually due to the fact that the talus is subluxed forward, and what a custom orthotic will do, it'll push this bone back into place as you're walking. The orthotic will also help control the knee, and here's the knee right here. When a foot is flat, the knee will bend inward. We call this valgus or knock knee. This will allow for the bottom bone of the knee, called the tibia, to rotate outward. So here's the knee, here's outward, and as I bend in, this tibia will rotate out. This will cause pain without having any tears that an orthopedic can find. Manual techniques for the knee and taping the patella, tib, and fib with either leuco or kinesial tape may help. Orthotics need to control the valgus as well. So they need to control the foot, the ankle, and the knee. Finally, if the knee is in valgus, the hip may develop a little bit of bursitis, which gives you pain down the side of your leg if it gets bad enough. Orthotics and strengthening is the key to control leg pain. This is my seven-year-old son, George, who I love spending time with. He is in all of my presentations. George does not have EDS, so we enjoy many family activities that a lot of you may not believe are possible for you to enjoy. I wrote this book to give you back some of these activities that my family takes for granted every day. You all deserve it. I hope my book will help you. I want to end with the last page of my book. Congratulations, you have made it through the Muldowney Exercise Protocol. There have been some bumps along the way, but you persevered and now your hard work has paid off. You are in control of your body and living life with less pain than you ever thought possible. Your physical therapists in this book have been your guide but you are the one who stuck with it and pushed through when things were difficult. This was not an easy journey, and you should be proud of what you have accomplished. Now that you have accomplished this demanding program, reach out to other patients who are just beginning their program and be a mentor to them. My wish for you is to continue with the maintenance phase of this protocol and you live your life to the fullest. Be proud and carry on. And I always quote my favorite person, Dr. Seuss, you have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes. 
you can steer yourself in any direction you choose. You're on your own. You know what you know. And you are the one who decides where to go. Um, right now, I'll take any questions. I'll go up to the question page and uh, thank, sign in thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. And and everyone who's listening, they can tell, um, you know, Kevin really gives his heart and soul to this and, and to trying to help our community. So um, we just wanted to tell you again that we appreciate you so much. And, and the almost 100 people that joined us live tonight are very engaged in um, uh, chatting back and forth in the public chat about the information that you're um, giving to us. So, um well, you'll see there's a lot of questions here. We'll see what we can get through um, this evening. So um, you can go ahead and go to the Q&A box and see what we find. Okay, excellent. Um, what I'm going to do is what I said is I hope that um, I'm only going to discuss the questions that have to pertain to physical therapy. Um, like I said, my job is to work on subluxations and dislocations with exercise. I don't like to talk about things that I'm actually not an expert in, especially in the EDS population. You need to have an expert with it. So I'm going to kind of go through some stuff, and if you truly think that it's an important question you need to get answered, and I have skipped it, just uh, go onto my Facebook page, and I'll try to send you to someone who's an expert on that so they can answer that question for you. So the first question is um, from Cheryl. Suggestions to those who would like to do aquatic therapy to get stability. Um, that's a good question. Uh, what I basically tell everybody is this. When you go in the pool, you have to go downstairs. So you have to make sure that you have the ability for your knees and ankles to handle that. The second thing you have to worry about while you're in the pool is that do you have enough core stability? I usually don't allow my patients into the pool until their sacrum and pelvis are stable and they can actually have that and also that their neck is stable. Remember when you go in the pool, if you're super weak, what can happen is the non-weight bearing could relax the muscles indirectly because if you're at your belly button, it's only about 50% of your uh, weight bearing you're doing. So when you come out, your legs could feel like jello because they really weren't strong enough. So I get a little scared about putting someone in the pool at the beginning, but as you strengthen up or as you're going through my protocol, especially at level four for the legs, yes, if you can't do the full weight bearing because your knees and ankles are really bad, and, you know, then we usually get you into the pool and then try to strengthen them in that way. Any advice on how to find good PTs that know manual therapy? Um, basically what I tell everybody is, is use the words. I, I wouldn't use the word manual therapy to get you through chapter two of my book, SI Joint, to get you started, as long as the physical therapist understands muscle energy technique and myofascial techniques, those are the only two things we do in chapter two, um, pretty much, and get you through the protocol. Also, somebody who's willing to actually teach you self-corrections, have your family member come in, do the muscle energy to you to get you better. And I think it's better, more important than a place where they're receptive to it as well as they're going to give you the time. So I think that's important. Uh, so, and, and again, she, she says that she's worked with a lot of physical therapists. But again, um, just use my book. As long as they're receptive to the book, I... I swear to everybody here, I walk a PT right through it. I mean, I, I try to work really hard with the PTs. Um, we've been working really hard with people, and PTs call me all the time, and I just kind of say, all right, do this, this, and this to help the person out. Um, the one thing the physical therapist is going to be a little confused about is if you have tethered cord, Chiari, to be able to differentiate that. 
my suggestions to the PTs are, if you're going through my protocol and after about 12 weeks, all of a sudden you're at level three mat, level three ball, which is my top level, and you're still subluxing a lot, you have a lot of problems with bowel and bladder, I would get to a neurologist and just rule out tether cord. Also, when you're at my neck exercises, if you can't get to level three, prone chin tucks, and it gets you dizzy, nauseous, we usually send you right off to, to get a consult with someone to rule out Chiari or um, cranial instability. So really, the ones that have really bad cranial instability, they lay on their stomach and they try to do a chin tuck, and they get dizzy, nauseous, I mean, really bad. And it's once you see it once, it's pretty easy to kind of tell, but I think it'll be a little confusing for a new therapist. But that's what the Facebook page is for, for me to kind of walk them through that to help it. Um, I started I started including planks that hurt my elbow and nerve. Deep tissue massage that left me black and blue and traction for my C-spine that caused neck and headaches for several days. Are, are there any absolute no-nos we should refuse regardless of what, I'm sorry, um, the therapist says. Um, basically, what, what I tell everybody is um, planks, you know, are no good for the EDS population. It puts too much strain on the shoulder and the elbow. Um, my whole entire lecture was don't do deep tissue massage to someone unless they're strengthening you. <laughs> um, and I, I never put a DDS patient on uh, traction ever. Um, your C1 is unstable regardless whether you have cranial instability or not. Um, there's a ligamentous laxity there. I, I don't like to actually pull on that with a mechanical traction machine. Um, I, I'm definitely a, a big fan of not doing that. I know some neurologists may disagree with me, so, you know, they're probably the experts in it, but I usually never do that in my clinic, um, uh, C5, uh, cervical traction, ever. I don't even do um, mechanical traction at all with the uh, EDS population. I usually fix their sacrum pelvis, align their spine, get them strengthened, and that's usually good enough for them. Um, any advice for someone who has bad scoliosis and EDS? Um, make sure if you have bad scoliosis, you don't have a tethered cord. I mean, tethered cord can cause a severe scoliosis. Um, everybody with EDS has scoliosis due to the upslips. And everybody with EDS has an SI joint dysfunction, I, I guarantee it. Two-thirds of your body weight pass through your SI joint. There is no muscle to strengthen. It's only ligamentous in nature. So what I tell everybody is, is if, as I walk or jump or do anything, ten times your body weight passes through the SI joint. So I have ten times my body weight passing through a joint where no muscles can help it in a population that has um, weakened ligaments, um, it's pretty hard not to have an SI joint problem um, when you have EDS. Um, so, I mean, I can't comment on other, uh, other protocols are pretty intense and may cause more pain. I mean, I wrote an exercise protocol, so I, I, I only do mine. I'd like to know more about bracing while exercising. I have a very unstable SI, but also have hypermobile shoulders and ribs. Well, that's a good question right there. Um, bracing with exercising. Uh, usually for the SI joint, we're usually in supine or prone um, while we're strengthening up the SI joint. We're, we're not standing at all, so usually you don't need to have a brace. But we also have them, if they get up and their, their SI joint is popping out, we have them use an SI joint brace. Uh, usually driving is really bad. But again, if they're walking around and it's okay, then I'd rather them not be in the SI joint belt all the time because we want to have them have sh some strength. 
um, hypermobility in the shoulders and the ribs. There are some braces for that. Like I said, ribs and shoulders, you can um, use tape for the shoulder to pull it up into the socket. And with the ribs, they also have some uh, nice bracing that they can use. Um, also, ribs are really bad for driving. So if you have really bad ribs when you're driving in a car, I always make sure that you have a brace on because uh, that really bothers somebody. But also, um, you know, any kind of activity that causes the ribs to sublux, wear it. If not, if the activity doesn't, don't wear it. Um, that's pretty much going to be my answer for every bracing. Um, are there exercises that can help with loss of muscle mass in the throat to help with swallowing problems? Uh, that's a good question, too. Um, one thing you want to look at, if you have swallowing problems, really um, you want to look at your jaw, C1, C2. Um, swallowing problems come from uh, the glossopharyngeal um, nerve that innervates the muscles. So that can actually be a problematic from C1, C2, or your jaw. So um, you need to kind of have somebody look at that, uh, preferably a neurosurgeon or a dentist, to see what's going on. Um, sometimes I'll just take the jaw and I'll, I'll pull it forward a little bit um, just to see if that helps. And if they can swallow better, then I'll probably send them to a dentist for some kind of uh, apparatus to where to pull that jaw forward off of the glossopharyngeal nerve. If that doesn't help, I'm usually sending them over to a neurosurgeon to rule out Chiari as well as uh, cranial instability. So with that being said, I also send them for any kind of singing lessons to help strengthen the throat. Um, my patients that came um, that had some swallowing problems before C1 instability did really well with singing after they did uh, cranial instability, and those those guys are really good with strengthening that stuff up. And who wouldn't want to sing, anyway? Um, how would you modify your protocol with those for, scoli for scoliosis who might have cranial instability and tethered cord? Um, again, what I, what I say is I don't modify anything. Um, everybody with EDS usually has scoliosis. Um, but again, if you think you have cranial instability, you think you have tethered cord, you need to get that fixed. You're not getting the neural input into the muscle. So you need to go there and actually get that actually fixed um, because you can trend until the cows come home. If I'm not getting the nerves basically go into the muscle and tell the muscle to contract, that input is not getting there because you have this neural input. You know, it's a lot more complicated than that, but in a nutshell, you're not getting that neural input, so it's much more difficult for you to strengthen. With that being said, if you're going to go for cranial instability or a tethered cord, I would use my protocol to get as strong as humanly possible. Uh, spinal fusions, I like to strengthen um, as much of the shoulder as humanly possible. The, sh the less the shoulder sublux is inferior, the less problems I have with my uh, OC1 spinal fusions uh, when I treat them afterwards. Um, is there a treatment for chronic TMJ? I have been I've been seeing TMJ dentists and tried splint therapy for over. Uh, 1.5 years, it doesn't work. How do you treat TMJ with your PT approach for EDSers? Well, again, when you have TMJ, usually the TMJ falls down and subluxes right or left. It's due to that forward posture that we talked about, the head forward posture. So again, we don't treat the TMJ until um, chapter three as we're treating the neck and the mid-back and everything like that. So we work on the signal of the pelvis, decrease your scoliosis, strengthen up the mid-back and the neck, get that forward posture back. That way your TMJ can sit in there more properly 
then strengthen up the TMJ with specific exercises in my book, and then if we need an apparatus, we can um, get it. What are your thoughts about getting Botox injections into painful muscle bands in spasm during a period before working on that part of the body while doing strength training? According to my pain management doc, he thought the strength of the muscle in my body would not be affected, but I question that. Um, Botox I'm not that familiar with. I know I do not have anybody in my EDS population that I work with get Botox. Um, I don't like weakening a muscle completely, seeing that's the only thing that's stabilizing the joint. Um, so I, I do like to just strengthen it up if you can. Um, if the muscle is really, really painful as you're going through it and you really can't do it, um, what I usually do is we do sometimes do a little massage to the area, then strengthen it right away. So that way it's not completely um, getting rid of all the spasticity, but trying to get rid of some of that lactic acid that's built up into the spastic muscle that's causing you pain. So, Any uh, specific suggestions for young kids? with EDS to help prevent later chronic pain. Oh, that's a good one, too. Um, again, a lot of people have talked to me on Facebook about my protocol, and what I tell everybody is that really, until a, a child's 14, 15, 16, they're not really going to do my protocol. Um, they're not really going to do my protocol at 14, 15, 16 either, but, you know, at least you, you have a, a little bit better shot. You know, my son's seven. You know, most of the exercises are three minutes to do. You know, for a seven-year-old, three minutes is like a million years to them. So it's really not anything that's great. Um, to work on for kids is, I would say, not a lot of jumping. That's that's the big thing for me is uh, jumping causing that SI joint dysfunction is, is pretty hard for me to deal with. Um, no contact sports. I mean, it, it's all listed out in the EBTS. Uh, um, EDS, uh, ednf.org. So just just follow the protocol. I mean, it, it's hard because you want a, a child to be a child. You don't want to protect them all the time. You want them to be strong and whatever. Um, but, you know, kind of get them into a sport that may or may not hurt them, and that should help them out. Hold on one second, so I can see where I am. Um, how do you find an orthotist? Is that a medical doctor? Um, no, an orthotist is actually uh, someone who makes braces. Um, so they went to school to learn how to make braces. So that's who I usually use. Um, a podiatrist may be able to make a uh, orthotic for the foot, but for bracing, I usually use an orthotist that can think outside the box, which could actually help out. Um, so, but that's that's who I use. All right, question from Germany. What therapy do you recommend for OC2 instability? So far, systematic full body isometric exercise and water therapy seem to help me. I don't tolerate head movement, cranial sacral therapy, or isometric neck exercises. Also, loading the arms for asymmetric isometric exercises trigger symptoms. In the past, cranial sacral therapy triggers my symptoms. I have OC1, C2 instability, cranial sacral 
therapy led to sublux feeling in my upper cervical spine, craniosacral junction, and subsequent nausea, tremors, um, arm pain. So basically he's asking, what do you do um, for that? So someone like that, um, we wouldn't do cranial sacral on because that will actually relax the muscles at the occiput. So remember, the um, C1, C2, the muscles from C1, C2 attach into the base of your skull. So if we're trying to relax those, those are not a good thing to do for someone who has C1, C2 instability. We're trying to strengthen them. But, I mean, that's a good question for someone who says, I can't move my head, everything hurts, I can only do isometrics, um, I can't really lift anything. Um, and my question to someone like that is, well, why aren't you getting a C1, OC1 fusion to get get back your life? I mean, um, I don't really understand that. It says, if you're not able to do a lot of stuff like that and your quality of life is horrible, I mean, you really need to go and, you know, find a good neurosurgeon who's who's willing to operate on you to help you out and get your quality of life back. There's, there's only so much I tell my patients that physical therapy can do for C1 hypermobility. There's a point where C1 sublux is so much that it's only exercise. I mean, some of the things are just exercise. So... You know, you can only strengthen a muscle so much to hold on to so much hypermobility there. And someone who can't even tolerate a chin tuck, who can't tolerate moving their head right or left, I mean, that's pretty bad. We need to get them to a neurosurgeon and really look at that. And then when they're done, go through the protocol, strengthen themselves up. They'll be able to do a lot more um, strengthening-wise, get their shoulders stronger, and get through the protocol that way. But like I said, you know, sometimes, you know, exercise is only exercise. Uh, the exercises of the SIJ lumbar make use of muscles outside this uh, region like the knee, yet the muscles of the knee are not mentioned. So subluxations that are present in the knee are not part of the SI joint lumbar strengthening series. This doesn't make sense. Um, basically, exercise for the SI joint and lumbar stave region works on transverse abdominis, multifidi, um, lumbar erector spinae, um, hip abductors and hip adductors, so your inner thigh and outer thigh muscles. Um, when you get into higher level ball exercises, you'll kick in a little bit of the hamstring, but um, I'm just basically working on stability of the multifidi as you're bridging up. Um, so I, I really am not working high level on the knee um, in my SI joint and lumbar spine, even though you may have to do some knee strengthening to do a bridge or lift your leg up, but that's not my primary goal at this point. don't think I am understanding why you would just call it a spasm. I definitely experience spasms. I know what that pain feels like. But the pain I experience day to day is different. It is an achy in my bones pain, not the light up pain. Pain like a spasm or cramp. If my hard rock hot muscles are solely because of spasm, are my muscles just constantly in spasm? With this, the pain people with type 3 experience 
is not just around joints. Sure, it is because of loss of loose joints, but I assume that's loose joints, but the pain is everywhere and anywhere. Personally, I actually don't have that much trouble with individual joints at all. It is more just area of my body, like low back, neck, legs, etc. cetera. Um, not really sure what the question is there, but what I basically tell everybody is when you're experiencing global pain, I would look at something like um, some inflammatory response that's going through you. Do you have some kind of digestive issue, mast cell, mitochondrial, that's causing everything to be achy all the time? So um, basically that's a, that's a good question. So when you're looking at an achy pain in a joint specifically, yes, I agree. It is definitely a muscle spasm. You definitely need to work on it and things like that. But if it's a global pain, I would look more of some kind of systemic thing going on with you. And again, you need to find the, you know, the uh, healthcare professional that's going to help you with that. All right. Uh, suggestions for school deaths are low. Hard, desk curves awkward around body, seems to contribute to back, neck, shoulder pain. What you suggest for students in public school? That is an awesome question. Um, we're working on that right now. Um, so the people at CAPD, I've, I've posed that question to them to try to find an OT that we can kind of set up some kind of a, a desk or something like that for um, kids, so we say we need these things at the desk to make it contribute, but I, I agree every time after the summer, all my teenage kids who are doing great all come in with back and neck and shoulder pain after about a month of school because they're sitting in lousy postures and everything like that, so we really need to work on that. Um, like I said, I don't have a suggestion right now, but we are working with that right now um, in my clinic with a few... Uh, people from uh, with the kids. If I sit on a cushioned chair, often when I arise I have immense pain starting in my upper thigh and through the leg. In my experience of subluxation, of which joint? Um, again, I'd have to kind of look at what that looks like. It, it's difficult to say right now if you're if that's it. Do you have a bulging disc in your back? Because if you're sitting in a cushioned chair, you're going to slump forward. It can either pop out um, your SI joint or your sacrum. And I always tell everybody, think of sacrum and sitting. So bad sitting posture pops out your sacrum. Or you could have a spondylolisthesis, or you could have a bulging disc, so that's hard for me to say at this point. When you were talking about there being external forces causing a subluxation, can the external forces be the weight of the limb or torque from the manner in which you are moving it? Um, absolutely yes. Um, if your shoulder is extremely subluxed um, and it's falling out of the shoulder all the time and it's dislocating both the anterior or posterior, it definitely is you know, just the weight of the shoulder dangling. Um, taping will help and trying to get that straightened out, but that's a that's a tough one to, to figure out. Um, so if it's falling out of the socket and then going forward and back, you got to figure out, A, is it some kind of neurological problem first? Is there C1 instability, Chiari tethered cord causing that neural input to fall out of the socket? Because, <clears throat> you know, I treat EDS all day, and when someone comes in with that kind of a, a problem nowadays, I, I don't consider that EDS. I consider that they're 
there's something else going on. Also, what about subluxations while sleeping? Is that because the extra stabilizing support of the muscle is turned off? That is why most of us build pillow fortresses to support joints. Um, absolutely. Um, sleeping is one of the hardest things. Um, the pillow fortress, I agree with 100%. If you can lay and sleep on your back, it, it is by far the best with a couple of pillows underneath your knees and don't allow your knees to fall out. Laying on your side um, really is bad for your shoulder with EDS, and it's, it's really tough to do. Um, I think that's a, an important thing. So really getting in a good sleeping posture, because that could be a trigger. Um, have your PT take a picture of you, or uh, not your PT, have your husband or somebody take a picture of you sleeping. Um, have them take a picture of you in your back so we can look at your back, your shoulder, and your neck. Take several while you're laying in your bed with your pillows, and then let your PT kind of look at it and make some dec um, decisions. We use our, our cell phones all the time or patient cell phones to bring pictures in so I can kind of get a glimpse of what they're doing at home so I can kind of make suggestions to help them out. Um, So what techniques do you use for chronic first rib subluxations? Um, yes, there are definitely easy muscle energy techniques for that. Um, if you go onto my website, MuldowniPhysicalTherapy.com, dot, um, dot uh, or go onto my Facebook, I can uh, write some kind of uh, thing on what to do with first rib subluxations, and I would probably need a little more information from you on why it's subluxing. You know, it's usually your scaly muscles that attach into your first and second rib are tight, which pulls it out, but why are those scaly muscles tight? Do you have double rotations in your neck and causing C1, C2 instability? So I would just need a little more information. So maybe on Facebook, you can kind of give me a little more in-depth stuff, and I can kind of problem solve it with you. All right, I, I'm going to go one more question. Um, yeah, so basically one last question. Do you see patients who pursue prolotherapy or similar therapies in addition to PT, what is your observation about the effectiveness of prolotherapy um, in the EDS population? Some of my patients do get prolotherapy um, to help with uh, tightening up the ligaments. I do see some good results with prolotherapy, uh, especially in the wrist and the hands because there are really no muscle attachments into the wrist. Um, so to kind of get them going, so it's really good. So with that, I think that's probably going to be our last question for the day. I want to thank again John and Deanna for letting me help you guys out as much as I can. Um, if you guys have any questions, please keep going on my Facebook page, which is the title of the book, and I'll try to help as many people as I can um, getting going. Thank you, Kevin. Um, we appreciate the wonderful presentation, and um, everyone – all the live attendees are really excited and real appreciative, and they're they're just um, impressed that they can go and have direct access to you. So that just really speaks to um, you know your your uh, passion towards uh, helping us. So again, thank you so much for everything you do, and and that you took the initiative to you know fill the void on this um, important. Um, part of our care that really that really is, is lacking and people are kind of um you know, at a loss usually. So now now there's hope and, and you know, we have we have something to turn to, you know, as a as a guide, uh, to try to get ourselves stronger. So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hopefully I helped some people out today. Thanks everyone for great. attending tonight. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks Kevin and, and all of 
those that attended. We had close to 100 on this call, which is really exciting. And I wanted to remind uh, those of you on the call that uh, this call is free. These webinars are free. We do have um, our sponsor, Body Support Store, that has over 250 products that are selected by EDSers for EDSers. Uh, so please go out and visit our store. We have a couple new products that you might be interested in, a new uh, pain cream that uh, might be uh, recommends and uh, you might find interesting. So, again, uh, thanks for joining us, and we appreciate you, your time this evening. And, your, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll meet again. Our next webinar is Wendy. On November 17th, and Dr. Bridgham is going to talk about um, nutrition and inflammation. And most of us uh, have challenges with systemic inflammation, of course, so that's going to be important to everybody to, to tune in and hear about. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for joining us tonight. Have a good evening, and we'll talk to you in another two weeks. Okay, great. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.